yeah. Okay, right. So uh, welcome, welcome to Robin, Robin Leach, who I met um, actually at a Salisbury Natural History Society meeting. I think we were sitting next to each other, and uh, Robin is the a farm ecologist for the uh, a farmer cluster group in the Wiley Valley, and uh, runs environmental projects and biodiversity monitoring, and gives farm advice. Um, and I sent him a. A list of, of questions um, asking him about the types of farm, his role, how Elms is working, um, how we can engage with farmers or what we can do and what more government help is needed. So um, I think it's going to be a very interesting um, evening and um, Robin would you like to fire away and tell us what you do and uh, how your life is, how stressful or otherwise? whether it's working. <clears throat> okay, I'm just going to... Um, Is the government and... a help or a hindrance? I think that's <laughs> all we'd like to know. I'm just going to try and share my screen, see if I can do this. Okay, has that worked? Is that going? Yep, yeah, I think it's all right for me. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> I'll just um, do a bit of background on the, on the Wiley Valley Farmers Group. Uh, which is a, a farmer cluster group um, in Wiltshire, obviously. Uh, we've got 30 members at the minute. I've actually just taken on a new one, a new one today, so 31 now. Um, and it covers uh, sort of the all the way down into the Devils. So everything you can see on this map that's in colour, um, apart from the, the green for the woodland. Um, but everything you can see on, on this map in colour is um, is a member's land. So we've got a, a pretty vast area um, of coverage and it all it all bases around uh, the River Wiley. Uh, and it's all in the catchment of the River Wiley. Um, so it goes from the from the Devils all the way down uh, to the Langfords and we're constantly trying to get new members, um, especially up in the headwaters where we've got a, a, a reasonable gap. Um, uh, we cover about 12,000 hectares um, and we've got we've got three main aims. So the first is water quality. So um, gen just in general, trying to improve the water quality of the river um, through various means. Uh, the second is soil health. So um, uh, working towards a regenerative system that improves the soil as well as uh, being able to grow crops alongside so that we're giving some back rather than just constantly taking uh, and then improve biodiversity so that's that's sort of the main one um, that we base a, a huge part of our projects and, and events on is um, is the biodiversity side of things um, and that has massive emphasis uh, for a lot of the farmers um, you know they're, they're some, sometimes people think that farmers just want to just want to go around killing all sparrows and um, that's really not the case they, they are really interested in what they've got on their farm and and how to improve things and how to make it better um, so that's the Wiley Bay Farmers Group um, I'm just going to talk now a little bit about my role so I was employed by Josh Stratton who runs um, JM Stratton and Co in Cod um, and he formed, he was a founding member of the Wiley Valley Fund. Um, and he, he sort of saw an opportunity um, at last year that, that farming needs to work alongside uh, nature, basically. And um, there's, there was lots of environmental projects that, that essentially he had ideas for, but didn't have the bandwidth to, um, to see them through. So he, he took me on. Uh, as, an, as an ecologist, um, so my background is in ecology. Um, it's, it's a very general role. There was no, you know, he didn't really know what he wanted from me. Um, and then I've, I've kind of filled a gap. It's such a, it's, it's such a, such a varied role. And it's, it's not something that you hear a lot, a lot of, you know, when do you hear of farmers employing ecologists? It just doesn't happen. Um, so it was a really interesting one to, to get into. Um, and one, one large part 
there is um, biodiversity monitoring. So biodiversity monitoring is, 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 is a tricky, tricky subject because um, biodiversity is very complicated and um, it's not easy to, especially on such a large piece of land, um, it's not easy to work out exactly what's going on. Invertebrate species are so numerous and so um, diverse, and they take very specific knowledge to be able to identify. And, you know, it's, it's incredibly hard to, um, to work out number and diversity. So what essentially I'm doing is, is working on, on the ethos that we work on indicator species. So I'm doing um, breeding bird monitoring, um, so right now at the minute I'm, I'm knee deep in, in survey work and trying to work out the, the species diversity and abundance, which is great at this time of year um, for birds because all the males are sat up singing, tell, telling you where their territories are. Um, and then the other side of things is butterfly monitoring. So butterflies are known to be indicator species for um, the health of a habitat. So you can, you can strongly assume if you've got good butterfly numbers that um, you've got good numbers of everything else. Um, and they're quite easy to identify and you can run regular transect routes um, as long as the weather tidies up a bit, um, which it has been a, a, a bit difficult so far. Um, and then using those, those two aspects, um, you can look at long-term monitoring of change so that 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 is that is key is you're, you're looking at changes through the years it's not a, it's not a short process um you might see no change at all you might see a dramatic shift you might get there's multiple factors um that are involved that might not have anything to do with with land use um and so it's a, it's a tricky subject but it's um this is my first year that I've started doing it on this farm, um, and, I'm, and I've already seen some some quite interesting things. Um, that picture that you can see in there is a um, a floristic margin, so it's a countryside stewardship margin, and we've got some absolutely absolutely incredible, um, incredibly diverse species um, strips on the on the farm, and we've got lots of um, lots of chalk downland, which is um, just an absolutely incredible habitat um, and it's 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 an interesting place to monitor to attempt to monitor you know it's the josh, josh alone has has five thousand acres so you know trying to walk around five thousand acres in a day is that it's a bit tricky uh, so it's got to be you've got to be sensible about it um, my next part and quite a large part is obviously the cluster facilitator so it was quite fortuitous that I came into this job at the time because um, the cluster group had been run, running for three years uh, with a lady called Helen Pengeli as facilitator. She stepped down um, because she's starting to retire. Um, so I managed to fit in that role quite well. Uh, and I've talked a bit about that and I'll talk a bit about um, a bit more about that as we go along. But basically we run, we run um, projects and events basically. Um, the projects, um, we've got some really interesting ones actually at the minute and the, the most interesting, which we're, I've actually got a, a chap coming out to, um, to write an article on tomorrow is, um, is called What's in the Wiley and we're doing, um, we're doing uh, pollution testing um, all the way along the, along the stretch of the river. So we're testing for nitrates, phosphates um, in 15 locations on a, on a weekly basis. And then um, we're going to be doing a process called uh, sediment fingerprinting, which is where uh, essentially you put a sediment trap into the river, which uh, slowly catches sediment. And um, you, you leave it there for a few months. And then in the meantime, you can test uh, all the fields, the soil in the fields upstream. Uh, and then once, you, once you've gathered enough sediment in this sediment trap, you can then test the sediment and you can directly um, fingerprint which field that um, soil has come from. Uh, so that, that has, that's sort of one of the instant effects um, 
monitoring that you can do on river pollution because you can you can directly see which which field has had runoff into the river um, and then you can and then you can mitigate through a, a variety of means uh, to reduce that factor or, or stop it completely. Um, so that, that's a fun, that's a really interesting one. It's making a lot of headway at the minute um, and we're getting a lot of interest and that, that specific project um, is going to be, it's going to be rolled out through all the other cluster groups in the, in the Avon catchment, hope, or, or the majority, the ones that have got rivers running through. Uh, so we're kind of a, we're kind of a pilot scheme for that specific project. Uh, and it's the, the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust has, um, helped us out a lot with that one they've they've created the methodology and um and <clears throat> and given us a bit of funding for it as well or found us a bit of funding <clears throat> so that's um that's 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 an interesting one we've also got uh nectar connector project which is um utilizing these strips and margins um to essentially create a, a sort of coherent network of habitat that runs all the way through the valley. Um, so we're trying to link up all the farms, link up all the all the chalk downland, um, and essentially make it so so a bumblebee can go from one side of the valley to the other without um, without leaving species rich uh, downland. Um, and that was that's been funded through uh, farming and protected landscapes, the Crack Crumble and Chase uh, area of outstanding natural beauty. Have um, have been helping us out with that one, and it involves um, a lot of mapping work, trying to work out the all of the gaps um, that are in the countryside and 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 linking them up, which is which is drastically important for for um, farm ecology. If you if you don't if you if you don't link these these habitats, then the risk of of local extinction is just just increases through the years. Um, and so it really, it really does work. Um, and you can, you can almost, almost see it in action uh, when you're looking. Uh, we're doing a, a large scale bat survey in the valley, um, which we're hoping to get a gauge on where the bats are moving from and to, um, in the hope that we can then adjust any any management um, that comes along with that. So we'll. We're working with the county recorder for bats um, on this, and we're hoping that we get lots of good advice <coughs> on where these big groups of bats are flowing and uh, which bits of the landscape they're using to travel. And then we can essentially enhance that and hopefully have a have a, a good improvement on the on the bat numbers. Uh, elm trees. So obviously, elm um, has had a hard time in the, in in the last hundred years or so. Um, there's a chap called Peter Shellcross who's um, who provides us with these disease-resistant elms. Uh, we've planted nearly 700 so far in the valley. Um, and elm, tree, elm trees are important not only because they they're the host plant of the white letter hair streak butterfly, but they're also they also provided a lot of a lot of good habitat for nesting birds and, and invertebrates because they were they were all rickety and um, had lots of holes in and and they were really good for owls to nest in and they were a real asset to the landscape that we that we've lost um, and so we're sort of generating that next generation of um, of elm trees uh, and then juniper. So we've got in the valley we've got a really good number of um, a really good population of juniper. Which is uh, uh, one of our three native conifer species, um, and so we're working with the charity Plant Life uh, to essentially um, improve the habitat around the the last population that we've got, and then uh, do some replanting and take some cuttings and then replant them, and um, essentially manage the habitat to be best for 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 juniper recolonization, which is great because it. It improves its, its, its sort of general um, chalk down and management that goes along with that. So um, it's really good for all the important butterfly and plant species as well. Um, and then we and then we run we will also run lots of events. So we do we do sort of you know from 
downland walks to um, events in, in woodlands to events on um, soil health and river quality. Um, and that's all facilitated funded through countryside stewardship. So we get we get about um, 25 grand a year, um, which covers all of my time um, and uh, all of the events that we run <clears throat> and um, helps out with the projects uh, that we go along with. So that's one, one really good thing that comes from countryside stewardship. Uh, and then I'll just move on to Council Stewardship itself. So um, I've just I've just redesigned our stewardship um, agreement because we've just applied for a new one. Um, and essentially, I'm working um, individually for our farm. I'm I'm working on doing something really good with this with this stewardship scheme, and not just doing doing the norm. And so I'm looking at how how we fully utilise those strips and margins, different species mixes, creating creating habitat rather than creating resources. So I'm 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 trying to change people's minds on planting these these winter bird food mixes because although the winter bird food mixes are fantastic and they they provide a, a small amount of nectar in the summer and then and then lots of nice seeds in the winter, they're not they're not what I would say is as good habitat. So you have to, you know, you have to, you have to cultivate and chop it up every two years. Um, the, the, most of the species that are in there are all, um, are all non-natives. Um, and so I'm, I'm looking to, to essentially redesign and, and utilize a, a mix that's been designed to be a habitat and to be left rather than cultivated and, um, and essentially create habitat rather than temporary resource uh, and then utilize and then and then we're planting lots of new hedgerows as well in the new countryside stewardship and they i've it's about 10 kilometers at the minute of of hedgerows that we're planting this, um in the next sort of three or four years um so that's that's going to be quite serious works in that um and then habitat management so we've got lots of nice habitat on the farm that kind of has has just been sort of managed in, in the contemporary kind of way um, over the years. And, and the important ones really are the chalk downland and the, um, and the chalk stream, the, the river. Um, and that, that's a difficult one because you don't, you don't want to come in as someone like me and come in and say, you're doing this all wrong, you need to change everything and then completely ruin the amazing habitat that you've got there so i'm kind of in a in a period of of observation and i'm going to spend the next year or two looking at how it's managed and and the different ways that, that the different areas are managed um and then try and just tweak just make small tweaks to the way that they're done um so that we really utilize those 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 habitats and um and don't lose them um, and then I offer environmental advice. So um, we've got a few farms that um, that my boss does um, contract farming for, um, and I'm 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 offering advice um, to them, and then encouraging others to join the countryside stewardship, and then help them out with um, with everything along there. Um, and then little tagline at the bottom: um, increase biodiversity without impacting on food production that that is absolutely key um to my role is to not impact on that food production um but you know increase the biodiversity as much as possible i'm i realize i'm pushing on for time but i'm going to move on uh elms so elms um i'm sure you all know but i'm just going to go through it briefly sfi sustainable farming incentive essentially that is the government's way of trying to give some of the um the the money that they've taken from the single payment so the single payment um is stopping which is where um you get paid per hectare um regardless of what you're doing that's stopping um which is the one good thing that's come out of leaving the eu in my opinion um 
So their, their way of giving some money back to the farmer is to encourage them to farm sustainably. And that's, and this is a fantastic, this is the best thing that could have happened from, um, from essentially the government getting involved with this. And so the farmer can get paid for uh, using regenerative practices, um, managing your hedgerows properly, managing your woodland properly. Um, similar to countryside stewardship, you get you get you can put in um, or you, you have to put in a certain amount of um, winter bird food and nectar strips. Um, the the uptake on SFI at the minute doesn't seem to be nearly as much as they wanted. We, we as a farmer are in the pilot and they have been um, since the second that it came out. So they're, you know, we're engaging with it as much as possible. Um, and so we're, we're in the pilot for the woodland, woodland standard and the arable standard. So there's various standards that the standards are increasing all the time. So the number of different things that you can get paid to do um, that they deem as um, sustainable. Um, and so we, we, as a, we as a pilot have found it. I mean, it's, it's, it's money essentially for doing what, what we were doing anyway, um, which makes complete sense. Uh, and the, and, and it is it should encourage other people to do this sustainable farming like we're doing and i hope that it will um and it seems to be it seems to be gaining traction all the time um countryside stewardship plus so this is the same as countryside stewardship with with extra options um and they're rolling this out sometime soon they're not they're not fully sure um but essentially it's it's going to keep countryside stewardship going um and hopefully make it easier to apply so that farmers are, are more encouraged to apply uh, and then offer better rates for, for doing things. So all the rates have gone up this year. So planting a hedgerow is actually quite profitable now, which is, which is another reason why we're planting so much. Um, it's just another benefit of doing it. So it makes it really easy for me to encourage my boss to plant lots of hedgerows when he can make lots of money out of it. Uh, landscape recovery. So landscape recovery is a scheme which is for large scale projects. So we as a cluster group are applying for, for a, a new project to start, which we're calling the wider Wiley, which is where we essentially revert what was done sort of 80 to 100 years ago when they drained all the land and, and straightened all the rivers. So we're going to be hopefully um, re-establishing that floodplain and re-wiggling the river, doing some planting and just doing general um, general river enhancement work. Um, and that's, that's sort of a, a, a side from those two schemes above. Um, and it's a really good one. It, it pays for really, really big projects and it helps you out a lot with these, with these large scale projects and they've had really good uptake on them. And, and the, the majority are farmer groups that, that have, um, that are applying for these it's you know it's not all um rewilding schemes or anything it is it's generally large farmer groups that are doing this um the farmer engagement with elms is an issue that defra made a, they, they made a bit of a mistake in in the recent past um they sort of had a fumble when they named they changed countryside stewardship to local nature recovery and then they changed it back and then and um so people have sort of lost a bit of faith in this but we we are really everyone we speak to we are really encouraging them to to engage with these schemes and um and you know um just get that free money for doing some good um and it seems to be slowly working i think once once defra actually um properly roll this out the idea is that, that the farmer in essence should be able to do especially the sfi they should be able to apply without having to get any advice um, because it should be set up very well and they shouldn't need an advisor to to do the actual application for them it should it should there'd be an online system it should be really simple to do anyone could do it um, and we just need a little bit of patience so 
farmers are, are struggling at the minute because they're panicking that the single basic payment is disappearing um, with nothing to sort of fill it. But this this will fill it along with other means. Um, and so we're, we're, we're desperately trying to, to engage farmers and get them get them moving on this, get them talking to DEFRA because the, the idea, our idea is that we can, um, if the farmers engage with it, then the farmers can essentially help design it. And, that, and that's absolutely key because the, the chaps that work at DEFRA, none, none of them are farmers themselves. Um, or you know, very few of them will will actually um, have experience of being a farmer, um, and so if the farmers engage with it, then they can help design it and they can make it easier for everyone. And and there'll be no potential of losing this money. This money this money has to be spent on this. If um, if 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 not enough farmers get involved and get engaged, then the money won't be spent and the money will disappear and then everyone will be essentially farming as much as possible and and plowing and and mm. and drilling right up to the hedgerows and and there'll be nothing left for nature because they can't afford to um to run without it so <clears throat> essentially the the engagement is is not quite that yet there but it's i think it's improving i really do uh so how to contact a farmer this is a difficult one um local knowledge is fantastic for this if you if you speak to local people local groups um then generally people know who owns what land um and someone will know someone who knows them um farmers are generally quite busy and um a lot of the time they don't want to they, they're not going to sit down and read an email about something they're not too interested in at the time so um that can be that can be that can be tricky um and there are obviously lots of different types of farmers so you get you get the, the people that are retired and don't actually do any farming at all you get the 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 landowners that that contract out the farms and kind of get involved but kind of don't and then you get the proper farmers that are very much on the ground doing everything and getting their boots dirty um and you kind of got to know what type of farmer you're talking to before um before you go and contact them um phone calls are good whatsapps are very good um and if you can get hold of a facilitator then they have a direct link so I know I know all of my farmers in, independently, um, and I know what type of farmer they all are, and I know I can tell you straight away whether they would get involved with um, whatever it is you're looking to get involved with. So um, speak to the facilitator. That's my that's my main advice. If there is one, if there isn't one, then um, just a friendly phone call or a friendly email, and 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 hope. <laughs> um, what to ask of politicians? So I'm I'm not fully sure about this one, um, because they are they are investing a lot in regenerative agriculture, which is which is sort of what I think is is really necessary for the for the for the, for the future, um, and putting public money into that is already kind of what they're doing. You don't want to push something that people you know um, that they're already doing. Um, it's a difficult one. I would say say hitting it a bit harder on pollutants and people who aren't regeneratively farming, who are potentially um, causing pollution in bad ways and um, businesses that are causing pollution. Pollution in the river, especially, is is my is is the main one that we're really trying to to um, get away from and trying to solve. Um, so that's that would be my main main advice on asking politicians is looking look more into pollution the, the environment agency the, the reason we're having to do this pollution testing projects is the environment agency don't have the bandwidth to um to do what we're doing essentially they they, they measure pollution but they don't measure it enough and they don't they don't um 
or not not in a, not not in enough places and not not enough time. So their their data layers are, are slim at best, uh, simply because they don't have the funding. So more funding for reduced pollution. That's my um, they're my tips and advice. And questions. I hope I didn't spend too long on that. <laughs> Thank you, Robin. That was that was great. Thank you. And um, we've um, we've uh, got some questions in the chat. Yeah. And um, I know we sent you a long email from Adrian, which you're going to um, deal with separately. So I think there are quite a few questions about um, carbon uh, measuring and so on. So should, would you like, like to have a look in the chat and go through those? Yes. Let's have a quick look. Uh, da -da -da. Uh, so elm trees, can other areas join in planting elm trees? Yeah, of course. Um, uh, so the, the, you can you can buy them um, from this uh, from various places. Peter Shawcross is the is our um, sort of link to that, uh, and he is in um, I can't remember where his farm is actually, but he's not far away from um, from where we are. Um, is, um, is he is he raising the trees or is he sourcing uh, no, the trees? So he sources them; they all come to him. Uh -huh. I think I'm not actually 100 percent on that. I need I would need to check that. But essentially, they've um, they've managed to I don't know exactly how, but they've managed to work out a way of creating a strand of tree that essentially is not mm -hmm. affected um, by Dutch elm disease. Um, not fully sure how, not exactly sure if it works. It's a, you know, you've got to wait a hundred years to see if it works. <laughs> um, but it's certainly the best thing um, to do for the time being. Mm -hmm. So um, essentially we're just planting these trees wherever, wherever we can. Uh, and then hoping that, mm -hmm. that in the future they grow to very nice big trees that can then support the butterflies and the owls and things. Uh, you mentioned the hair streak butterfly in relation yes. to the elms. I mean, what's happened to the hair streak, white hair streak butterfly in the meantime? Um, you can't wait 100 years, can it? No, it they are still around. So elm trees will, will grow until they're I'm not sure exactly what age, until probably, you know, in the 20s, um, and then they'll start to die. And that seems to just be enough um, that the white letter hair streak can survive on. I'm not sure... It's very hard to study the white letter hair streaks, spend a lot of time in the, in the trees. Um, I'm not sure if they've done, if, if they're managing to adapt to live on other trees. I don't think they probably are because they're, they're more and more um, uncommon. Um, but they, it seems that they're managing to stay, or their population is managing to stay reasonably stable or not this not they're not disappearing too quickly they are they are it's going down but um mm. hopefully if, pe if people keep planting these elm trees which a lots of people are mm. um then they should be able to establish enough um once they get a bit larger and and, and create a new population so that's worth worth something that we we in our projects it's worth us having a go at definitely yeah and and he's also looking into black poplar um which is apparently the um britain's rarest tree um and there's lots of i can't remember if you said female or male that we've, we've got a few you know we've got some trees around but they're all either female or male i can't remember which one um and so they're looking to plant lots of the other ones because they're just sort of standing there dying not being able to breed um and so that that'd be an interesting one as well planting planting specific species that are having an issue um sort of all over the place and then and then sitting and waiting and hope hope it works <laughs> okay the next uh was about the um uh the sediment trap and which field how how can you tell from the sediment trap which field it came from so how specific is that how 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 can you be so spe specific so um Rothamsted research which is a research sort of university in um uh, down in dorset i think um they they developed this method which is essentially it uses a it uses color so you take 
you take a sample of soil from the fields upstream from the river, you put them through a scanner, a, 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 just, a, just a general um, office printer scanner, um, and then you run that through a computer system, which then um, detects color to a really fine level. And then you take the um, sediment out of the silk trap and do the same process with that. And then the, the computer system will, will directly link um, the color. So it's all to do with color, it's fantastic. And they have, they have all these other um, chemical methods of doing the same thing, but they have found over the years that, that actually this, this really simple technique using a, a printer scanner is actually um, just, as, just as direct and just as, um, uh, or it works just as well. And so that is down, literally down to field level, to, you know, to field level. Yeah, yeah, it can it literally directly, directly to the field. Mm. So that, that's, where, that's where you can have these really direct results. So you can instantly, you know, the, the, the idea is that once you find that field um, sediment is getting into the river, that you then, you then look at, firstly, look at why. So there could be, there could be a gateway, there could be a, a track. Um, and then you work out a way of mitigating. So you plant a hedgerow or you put, you move that gateway, uh, you move the track, you put a buffer strip in there's lots of lots of other ways that you can you can get get around that and it's just about working field by field and working out which ones are getting in the river and then you just you just essentially keep doing it and then and then you have a dramatic effect on on that sediment and how much is getting in the river which also has has an effect on the chemicals because a lot of the chemicals will come from from that sediment so it's it's kind of doing the two at once Okay, um, so the next one was my question, actually. Um, you mentioned getting more farmers. Is that to make your bigger landscape recovery schemes work better? Right at the beginning, I think you mentioned you were yeah. you know, trying to get more farmers in. And, yeah, uh, we always... I or just, it just as a general drive to, to make yeah. countryside stewardship work, which you, I think you also mentioned. Yeah, so, so firstly, the more... The more members you have, the more money the countryside uh, the facilitation fund will will give you, which means we can do more. Um, and secondly, it's just about farmer engagement. So the more people that we have, the more people are coming to events, and the more people are getting involved with projects and improving um, their habitats on the farms and learning more about the species that that are visiting and having more of a general interest in um, in nature, basically. Um, Julian, the next question was yours, wasn't it? Um, how, how are farmers moving towards more organic methods using less pesticides and fertilizers and antibiotics? How is that actually being achieved? Um, that's difficult. I don't, think, I don't think organic farming is necessarily the answer. Um, the, SFI, the SFI does, um, part of the SFI standard is um what's called my brain's gone blank here um essentially it's about it's about reducing reducing your inputs um and my my hope is that through through improved habitat management surrounding the field and you can essentially reduce the need to put on these inputs and it's it's proven it's proven to work if you put if you put um nectar margins around your fields then um it's proven to have increased yields and um increased uh they're called beneficial insects so the insects that are going into the field to prey upon the insects that are that you will be spraying against um and so the trouble is with, with organic farming is that you can't, um, you can't use any chemical to destroy the cover crop. So that you, no. can't, you essentially can't farm regeneratively. Um, or, you know, you, there's less of a potential to be able to farm regeneratively. Um, so I don't think organic farming is the answer. 
If I could, I just um, so I, I wasn't. That's why I said move towards rather than you know, go yeah. organic. I mean, <clears throat> you know, I think there's probably general agreement that need to reduce pesticide inputs. Yeah. Uh, and obviously, fertilizer inputs are expensive and, and not very good for runoff and all this sort of thing. And antibiotics are really bad for you know uh, uh, resistant diseases and things. So I imagine that the farmers want to do you know, move towards it. And I was just wondering, you know, if, if there was any experience on that sort of. I think. I think. Farmers don't want to put, the, if they could put nothing on their fields, then they would be very happy about that. They don't want to have to pay to put, and unfortunately, some of the chemicals are really cheap, which is annoying. Um, it, I, I would prefer them to all be horrendously expensive to, so that they try all other means to not put them on there. Um, but in essence, the farmers don't want to put them on. Sometimes if, if, they, if, if their agronomists are paid for how much they sell to the farmer, um, then you've got that direct conflict there of, of the, the, the agronomists that are encouraging the farmers to put on as much as possible so they get a, a big payout. Um, we, we pay our agronomists per hectare, so they have absolutely no, they, they've got no drive to put on anything that isn't absolutely necessary. Um, the opposite, really, because they, you know, they want to, they want to save as much money and as much fuel um, hours, everything as possible. Um, so I think we just need everyone just needs to reduce all these chemicals that are going everywhere, and that's one that I'm yet to sort of start pushing. Um, because I mean, it's, it's it's a very difficult one, and like I said, they will they'll only put it on when they have to, but I guarantee there's some farmers that put a lot more than they have to on. Um, and and with, with the animal side of things, most of the, so there's this sort of assumption that, that most cow um, farmers will, will worm their cows every five minutes and, and that kills all the dung beetles. From my experience, that's not actually the case. They don't, again, they don't want to be giving their cows worms worming treatment all the time they'll only give them when they have to um but i think a bit more emphasis can go on that when they have to so i think um we should be encouraging farmers to do um to do uh, fecal egg checks um on their cows um and then uh, you know the only worm when absolutely necessary um and lots there's 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 there's, there's so many small problems like that that come along with um with farming and it's just sort of slowly working um with one at a time and and hoping that you make traction and people listen um i think there was a question about farmers getting advice but i'll i'll i'll, I'll move swiftly on because we seem to be getting lots of more questions as, as i as i scroll it down so we've got one from kate who's asking um, what what's what's happening to the current SSSI um, sites, um, and how are they integrated into landscape recovery and other schemes? And uh, we've um, got an example of that. So, essentially, nothing is happening with the drip SIs. They um, they're heavily monitored, and you can't you can't do anything to them without requesting permission. Um, we. The landscape recovery obviously affects the river, which is a triple SI. That that shouldn't be an issue. Um, Natural England will be heavily on our side to do work like this, and our our local um, Natural England advisor is is very good at, at helping us out with these types of things. Um, all the other triple SI sites are, or the majority are, are downland, chalk downland. Um, and again, they're, they're, they're essentially managed the same way they have been for, for quite a long time, which is, a, which is simply doing some grazing. Um, and then, and then we, we personally on ours do scrub clearance every year. So in the winter we go in um, and we clear, you know, a, a percentage of the scrub that's appeared so that um, we keep it as species diverse as possible. Um, and each time, each time you do anything, again, you have to you have to get permission from Natural England, which is which is a really good thing actually. And these that 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 
that is quite a useful thing. And I think it's one one thing that natural England are going to struggle with going forwards. Um, and because of because of lack of funding um, for things, but we we've, we've got we've got a, a, a project going on at the minute, which is um, to do with the junipers, and um, we there is a triple SI on our farm that had been left, um, and lots of ash had grown on it. It was a steep bank, um, and essentially all the ash died because of ash dieback. Uh, and so we got permission to uh, clear fell it, and um, and then we're running a project with Plant Life to uh, essentially re-establish the juniper, as same as we've done on other places, uh, and manage it as chalk downland. And um, that's just started actually, and that's that's going to be a really interesting project to to go into. Uh, and that that's that's actually uh, another scheme called species recovery which is similar to landscape recovery but directly linked to red list species mm. uh, which is the the juniper juniper is a red list species uh, and so that's one other one that we're applying for is um is funding to to do that um uh julian was asking what uh, what is your approach to methane reduction and and targets and and how can you assess progress in terms um, of methane reduction is that something that's been worked on in the cluster no not at all and it's an interesting one actually because i'm i'm, I'm sure you've all heard of there's there's is it a seaweed that the, the cows can eat mm. that reduces their methane mm. um we don't actually have a, a lot of of cows in in the group you know i mean on on our farm specifically we've got a few but they're just lawnmowers they just go around and and um and um keep the the downland nice and short in the winter um, and keep the grass down um, you know it's not it's not an intensive dairy uh, beef herd um, but there are a few um, beef farmers and a few dairies in the group so that is actually quite an interesting one because it's quite a simple one with you you know um, I've not looked into it much at all really um, I just watched it on on something and um, it sounds so simple, you know. You just put a bit of this in, in cow's food, and then you reduce the <laughs> yeah. food. Then that's I mean, why is everyone not doing that? Yeah, I mean, it is of course cows and sheep are the sort of big ones. Um, yeah, and um, it, the food additives. I don't know what percentage they're reduced by, but probably you know only a relatively small amount mm. at the moment. I don't know how how far it may go in you know successfully doing that. But I mean, the other thing is looking at um, diversifying and, um, you know, uh, making us more self-sufficient in some of these sort of, uh, you know, arable crops that, you know, for, for humans, instead yeah. of, um, you know, the, um, the amount that we, uh, you know, rely on livestock, which inherently do produce methane. Indeed, indeed. Uh, yeah, I, I'm a massive, I mean, I'm, I'm vegetarian and I'm, and which, as I, which is a shock to some people when I go around their farms and I say, <laughs> Um, we've actually got one farmer in the group who is a beef farmer and he's vegetarian um, and he's constantly talking about how we should stop eating meat as he's growing meat in his fields <laughs> um, yeah uh, but but no I I completely agree reducing reducing our meat intake is is drastically important but I, I it's it's just one of those things I don't know how you convince people to 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 stop that or to reduce reduce how much they eat. I think it will happen over time. Yeah, I mean, do you think that's something which which basically, again, in terms of where we direct our um, uh, lobbying or what have you, I mean, that's a, that's a, a national issue in terms of, of of what politicians are saying about meat production and, and our diet generally. I mean, is, that, is that the level? I mean, the, the farmers that you work with are not... Uh, they're not going to be um, changing. I mean, most of them are arable from the sound of it, but they, yeah. even the vegetarian with his cows, is is also not convinced enough to get rid of his cows. <laughs> is what you're telling us? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. No, it's it's yeah, it's not a problem that um, that our small farmers, even in the whole of the UK, really can solve. It's this is that's a it's a huge scale problem, but. I think I think that that's one that that will 
you know, over over time, once these these other these meat replacements and um, and even even cultured meat, cultured meat will be a thing one day. You know, you'll you'll have you'll have you'll have a meat maker in your kitchen that that grows your steak for the evening. Um, but that's a long way away, and so it there does need to be this reduction in 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 meat intake um, before that, and and eating local as well. You know. Eating locals seemingly so expensive, um, but I'm sure people would be able to afford it if they didn't eat so much. Um, yeah, is that something you think your farmers uh, in the cluster would be interested in? Because that's what that's something that people people often say. What can I do? And you you can say eat local, and they say, well, how do I do that? Um, <laughs> is that something that your farmers would be interested? In? I mean, the guy with the cow, cows, <laughs> the vegetarian with yeah, the cows, for example. I think- I don't. I don't think farmers are, are the issue there. I think they're probably the best um, at eating local because um, generally they've got more money than lots of other people. I think. Um, no, I was thinking about the. Music. I was thinking from the other point of view. Are, oh, are, are the farmers interested in reaching out to local people to say we've got this? I mean, in the way in the way that we have uh, milk machines. I've got a milk machine down the road. Yeah, yeah. Your milk from local suppliers, for example. The, the issue that the issue there is is a time factor, and it you know it depends what type of farmer they are. It depends how large large they are. The the large scale farmers don't want to be doing things like that because it's not it's not in their best interest. Um, whereas the smaller producers are likely already doing it, or if not doing it, then looking into doing it because um, of the the need to di- diversify. Um, but it'd be an interesting one to. You know to look into more um and potentially offer offer advice on or um you know offer assistance on um i'm, I'm going to jump kate's asked a couple of, que- of, of questions yeah. but i'll jump from her first second one coming down to her first kate if i may because um this was the question about Who's advising farmers on this? Where where are farmers getting their advice from? Is it just within the clusters? Is that what you meant, Kate? It Um, is. Um, I'm a bit out of touch, but I suspect that like all of the um, government bodies, whatever they're called, are very poorly funded. Um, You know, it used to be ADAS, didn't it? Or yeah and it's just when you were saying that individuals we can bring up farmers it's like i i work on a farm um mm. i know that my the farmer has absolutely got not no time for that yeah. kind of thing what they need is people knowledgeable people employed to bring out this elm scheme and and to get it out there so that i was just making the point really that yeah. it's a bit of a rant um, but well, the idea of the elm scheme is that the, the farmer shouldn't need advice to do it is that um and and the government are offering advice uh, under the name of um uh the something fund there's a there through elms they are offering free advice right this cla as well the um i can't remember what it stands for but um there's there's quite a few different streams of advice out there now um, but I don't know. I don't know. I, did, what... I think I, I think I have a thing about environmentalists lobbying farmers to try and get them to change. Mm-hmm. You know, um, really, what your your point about buying local is the best thing that people can do yeah. because it's the small local farmers that are doing things properly. Mm-hmm. Um, but they're there, and they're certainly not making loads of money. Mm-hmm. Um, I have to pick you up on that one as well. <laughs> <laughs> it's the opposite you know they're really 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 this guy's jeremy clarkson yeah yeah yeah. yes yes i mean it's a very um, interesting question because last last month uh you know i talked to elms i've looked at elms i mean if i had to do that you know in my garden as to what i planted i'd i'd be mad by lunchtime um in my opinion so (laughs) anyway so so we're sort of running out of time and Mm. uh We've got some, uh, there's more questions about measuring um, carbon and uptake, so CO2 uptake, um, which was another one from you, Kate, wasn't it? So how, um, how it, are you measuring that in the cluster, the CO2 oh, income? Oh, CO2. So are, you, are you measuring it on the... Um, um, no, um, no, not at all. 
Um, it's not a very easy one um, to do, I don't think. And it's it's kind of one of those that that it's it's one of those that if you farm regeneratively, you know that you know that your soil is is doing better, or that the the research states that your soil is doing better. So there's not much point in spending lots of money to look into um, the different things that are actually happening in the soil. You can you know you can you can look at it's it's important to go and dig holes and count the worms and look at the soil structure and things like that. But in terms of of doing quite complicated things, it's it's complicated, it's expensive, and you, you're better off, or the country as a whole is better off going by the ethos that if you're doing it in a certain way, then the assumption is that your your soil is doing well on those aspects. And then you leave the, um, the actual... Uh, research to the research companies and the universities and the the, the companies that are doing um, all of this soil matter and organic matter and CO2 and um, everything like that. Basically. Can I just make a quick comment on that, Robert? Yeah. In America, in some areas, they actually, there's a fairly standard procedure for taking a core soil core um, and you know, measuring the soil carbon. And in America, they actually use this as the basis for payouts for regenerative farming subsidies and you know unless yeah. we measure it then it's all very hand waving and uh, you know i think it's really quite important that i don't I, I i i assume there must be something equivalent in the well you have to do so to be part to be in the sfi you have to send off soil samples um and so essentially you're doing a bit of that um but it depends you know it just depends on how deep you go into that you're looking at you're looking at organic matter you're not looking at, at mycorrhizal fungi or um, CO2 that's going in there and, and very specific in things like that. You're looking at, at basically organic matter, structure, worm, worm activity, um, things like that that are simple, quick and easy and cheap to look at and give you those give you the assumption that, that the other things are coming along with that. Okay, thanks. Yeah, <clears throat> I assume that the organic matter directly relates to the um, amount of carbon dioxide that's gone in there. Yeah, yeah, should do. Hmm. Okay.